So one of the, the most interesting things that I found, and, and that was most surprising to me really, was in my interviews with egg donors and sperm donors, um, it became very clear that the sperm donors had a very straightforward view of themselves as fathers to the uh, children who are born as a result of their donations, whereas the women were absolutely adamant that they were not mothers. Um, and that's so surprising because women and men each provide half of the genetic material that you need to create an embryo. And so the question is, well, why would they have such different uh, ways of thinking about their relationship to their biological offspring? And I think that it really comes back to, um, in our society, how we define what makes a mother and what makes a father. Um, and as a result of reproductive technologies, um, the, the definition of what makes a mother is much more flexible. Um, there are different women who can contribute to one particular child. So there can be one woman who provides the egg, one woman who carries the pregnancy, another woman or women uh, who raise the child. Um, and so in that sense, our definitions of motherhood can be sort of partitioned out into different elements. Whereas our definitions of fatherhood are not quite so flexible. We still have a cultural equation in which providing a sperm uh, makes a man a father. And so it's, it's very difficult for sperm donors to say uh, something that I heard from egg donors over and over. Sperm donors would not say, well, all I did was give just the sperm, so I'm not the father. Whereas egg donors were just, you know, to a person, I interviewed women in different parts of the country um, who donated through different donation programs, and I heard over and over and over, well, all I did was, all I gave was just an egg. Um, and they can say just an egg, and I'm not the mother because they weren't carrying the pregnancy, they weren't giving birth, they weren't raising the child. So they were distancing themselves from that label of mother, um, in part because of how technology has changed how we define families. I didn't do research on surrogate mothers um, or women who were the recipients of egg donations, for example, or women who are, are mothers through old-fashioned means of reproduction. Um, but uh, research by other scholars really demonstrates that uh, the flexibility of these definitions. So if we took, you know, I was talking about egg donors saying, well, it's just the egg, I didn't carry the pregnancy, I didn't give birth, I didn't raise the child. People who interview surrogate mothers um, find that surrogate mothers will say, well, all I did was just the pregnancy. I didn't give the egg, I'm not raising the child. And so surrogate mothers will distance themselves from that label of mother. And so that's where I'm pointing to the flexibility um, in our definitions of maternity, of what it is that makes a woman a mother. Um, that the person who provides the egg, the person who provides the pregnancy, the person who raises the child, any one of those women could lay claim to that label of mother or not, depending on her eventual intentions of parenting that child. Where we have seen some of the most controversial court cases in assisted reproduction have been of surrogacy. So there was the Baby M trial in 1987. Um, there was another uh, legal decision in California, Johnson v. Calvert, that came a few years later. And both of those were around the definition of who should be identified as a parent. Um, and in the United States right now, in general, the fertility industry um, and assisted reproduction it goes pretty much unregulated. And so we have a state by state system where some states uh, ban surrogacy, some states allow surrogacy, some states allow surrogacy but don't allow it to be compensated. Um, and th the same thing with egg donation and sperm donation. There's sort of different regulations around uh, who, ab around how these technologies work depending on what state you're in in our country. Um, and so that produces a situation that is very difficult to, to keep track of. And it actually is in pretty stark contrast to many European countries where there is uh, far more regulation around uh, donation and anonymity and regulation uh, um, around compensation. So we in the United States have very few regulations compared to most other industrialized countries. I don't know that I would necessarily be in favor of more regulation. I think that, um, you know, recently there have been stories in the news of a sperm donor with 150 children um, or some of these, these court cases around surrogacy that I've talked about. And every time one of these sort of scandalous stories about the fertility industry comes out, the, the first call that you see in the newspapers is for more regulation, more regulation. Um, and I think that's understandable, but I would take a step back and say, well, first of all, we actually need more information about how 
the fertility industry works. At this point, there is no um, national body that collects statistics about how many egg donors and sperm donors there are in the United States, about how often they donate, uh, about how many children are born from egg or sperm donations, about what happens to those children. So we just have just an absolute dearth of information about how the industry actually works. So I would argue that before we can regulate, we have to know what's going on. And so my call would actually be for more, um, more data, more information about how it works.